<laughs> Welcome. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Reddy as our speaker this morning. Professor Reddy comes to us from Texas A&M University, Department of Mechanical Engineering. He has been there for a little over a quarter of a century. After having some uh, short stints at some other institutions in Oklahoma, Virginia, Texas also in, at Austin, and Alabama, if, if I remember properly. Um, he is a very uh, prominent and very prolific person in the area of mechanics with uh, very high citations. And um, I knew about this production that he puts out, but uh, I didn't know that he published as many as 21 texts, which is quite a record. Some of them I'm using in my classes, two particularly in the uh, for plates and shell analysis and for the finite limit method as well. But I'm, I was aware of a few other ones, but not all 21 of them. Uh, the area is mechanics, but particular emphasis of Professor Reddy's uh, activity is uh, structure mechanics, I would say, and contributions in the area of analysis of plates and shells, and that's what is going to be the topic of the presentation today. Uh, recognition that uh, Professor Reddy got uh, for his uh, uh, publications are many, and uh, some of them are very prestigious, like membership in academies of engineering in the United States and Canada, India, and Brazil as a foreign member of those countries' academies of engineering. Uh, in addition to that, he got a, a number of awards of different sort, but the most prominent of them, again, are the awards uh, that he uh, received from the main engineering associations in, in the United States and elsewhere. In the United States, uh, he received a, a Prager Medal of Society of Engineering Sciences, ASME Medal of American Society of Mechanical Engineering, von Neumann Medal from U.S. Association of Computational Mechanics, and von Karman Medal from American Society of Civil Engineers. So, <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> and all these achievements come on t as a kind of frosting on top of his uh, wonderful, humble personality. And I think you will appreciate that during the presentation today. So please join me welcoming uh, Professor Reddick here. Thank you, Henrik. So this is my... I, I don't know, at least a second visit, if not third. I don't remember the very first one, but I came many, many years ago. So what is this, a gopher country, is that right? <laughs> All right, so uh, I was at Virginia Tech, you know, then you heard Hokies, right? I was at Oklahoma, Sooners. Now I'm at Aggie land, Aggies. I don't know how many of you know Aggie means agricultural uh, university. So I'm very happy to be here uh, to share with you a few things, but most importantly when I go on seminars like these, I keep in mind young people. Well, everybody compared to me is young here, <laughs> except for Ted. <laughs> so, so I want you to take, uh, I mean I say over the years of my doing passionately what I do, I learned a few things. So I want to share those as background before I get into the technical area. So here is the roadmap. So basically I will talk about the shell elements, that's the title, but I added a little bit of a bonus here. You see that in red? So I will, because that has been my more recent uh, interest in non-local. 
And many of you, of course, the word is very clear, which is not local is non-local, right? So, so, but I'll explain a little bit more, okay? So it's not that difficult for you to understand. Okay, so in the way of background, I want to really, I was talking at breakfast with Ted and Hendrik, most of you are taught, uh, whether it is the elasticity or continuum mechanics, books where you are told these are the governing equations, right? But these equations, they are based on certain assumptions, right? The principles are valid, okay? But uh, when you apply the principle, we write the statement of that principle in an analytical form, but then we make assumptions. One of the major assumptions we made is this continuum assumption that will neglect or overlook the discrete nature of the structure for the goal of determining the global response characteristics, right? So, so that we can take this limit, delta x goes to zero, does not make the point to jump from one atom to the other. It does, but we are overlooking the discrete nature and so that we can take the derivative. So then you ask, why should we have a derivative? So this is also part of the assumption, okay? So you realize that continuum mechanics is a model. Ultimately, it is a model that engineers devised for the purpose of gaining some insight into physical phenomena. And it has helped, there is no question about it. But I want you to know it is a model and it is subject to improvement. And that is how the non-local things coming now, although they started a long time ago, but now they are coming back because we have the power, computational power to include missing information as we deem necessary. So that means the models go, you know, uh, through improvement modifications. So the second comment has to do with uh, the fact that I want to say there is no such thing as exact mathematical model of anything that we do. There is nothing, okay? And a lot of times civil engineering folks are put under microscope to say, oh, they do very, you know, uh, approximate things, very, very, you know, uh, approximate in the sense that you create some formulas with fudge factors, all that. But the reason is we are all engineers end of the day. Meaning we want to solve problems. Engineering problems that face our society in whatever way, whether it's a defense, transportation, and so on. So in the, with the goal of solving the problems, we have to make assumptions, dictated by the goal, of course, the goal-based thinking. So along the way, we develop these mathematical models, but they are only approximate, right? So, so but on the other hand, we always make sure that we can improve. See, that is where most of the research is. Okay, even if it is infinitesimal incremental step, we take pride in that. Because like once Mother Teresa said, when you think of every contribution is a drop in the ocean, she said, ocean is nothing but collection of droplets, right? So every one of you do something, you don't beat your chest because it is only infinitesimally small. We use the word epsilon, right? Okay? But collectively, we are making a big leap to help the society in general, okay? So I like you to keep that in mind. I mean, take pride in whatever little we do. I mean, that really all of us, you know, doing exactly that. So very few of us are Einstein level to make a big contribution. So he may be million epsilons, okay? But ours are, somebody makes one epsilon, somebody 10 epsilons, but collectively we make a big difference. So then there are only two things that matter in engineering. So probably most of you know, but I will remind you. One, whatever we do, we make note of the, the important thing is to enable this uh, reliable functionality in that system. Okay, whatever system you design or work with, develop. 
and the second is cost, right? So this, the second one is not taught that much in our engineering subjects, although there is a course that as an undergraduate you are required to take, right? Engineering economics. So, but I think it is very important because we, whatever industry does, when they improve, the improvement has to be also validated against how much it is going to cost. Can we have a market for this improvement? Is it? And this is where the designer makes the decision. Not everybody is a designer, but designer is really making a decision between the functionality, degree of functionality or reliability versus the cost. And that is where the application dictates that. If it is a medical device, we want more reliability and we want to put more cost, okay, to have that reliability. But if it is something that you can repair easily and there is no human lives at risk, then we tend to take a risk and say, well, we'll make it as cheap as possible, right? So this is the type of thing that we do in engineering. So one last comment as a background is talk about these methods of discretization. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, everything that we do is based on certain model, a mathematical model, which is nothing but a construct of using physical laws to write the equations governing the process. And this set of equations is what we call mathematical model, right? So, but these mathematical models in real world cannot be solved by analytical means. So we have to use approximate numerical methods, more important computational methods, meaning a numerical technique that can be computed using computers because it leads to large number of unknowns in terms of certain quantities of interest. So because of this computational need, we have come up with many different methods. So one of them, I will name a couple of them. Of course, the finite elements. The, this is probably the most popular of all the methods that you will see, especially for this group, okay? And I know there is an environmental group also, there's some of you, and fluid mechanics. So there is this method known as finite volume, which is a kind of in between. It is a stepchild to finite difference and finite elements. Unfortunately, even in academics, there are politics. Okay, meaning they try to copy the words like finite, which is common to both finite elements and finite volume. And then, see the volume, word volume is inappropriate when you apply the method to 1D or 2D, right? But yet they use that, but that's, I'm not arguing about that. But it is a method which came from the subdomain method, which is very popular in the context of variational methods, up and on which you satisfy the equation that governs the phenomena. Okay? So this finite volume is nothing but control volume, which is a subdomain of the structure. And then, and of course, Hendrick's advisor, former uh, Ted Belichko from Northwestern and other folks worked on this uh, meshless methods, which is really not meshless, but let's agree on it. <laughs> okay. so, so, but this is, uh, so you can see there are always these uh, people wanting to be famous by creating new phrases and, and so that it would be called, right, you know, and there are people who call, what is this, uh, uh, elements that are very special named and people can't even figure out what that means. So, but it, so my point here is all these methods have something common and all of you are seeing it. Okay, see that is where seeing the real thing, all these pictures, circles, triangles, quadrilaterals, but end of the day, the computer only knows one thing, which is these points. Okay, really. End of the day, this A x equal to B is what computer is solving. So what is that? It is nothing but a set of algebraic relations between the x and b. And x and b are duality pairs. 
Okay, duality means in nature there is a duality. Okay, it's not just only in engineering, and duality is only very unique duality, meaning there is no polygamy. Okay, I'm sorry to use these kinds of words, but you understand, right? So means there are pairs of variables, pairs like force displacement, right? Heat and temperature. They are unique. Temperature is not going to be dual to a force. So this unique duality is what the mathematical models preserve. So the any of these numerical methods end of the day create the system of algebraic equations that relate to these duality pairs. So displacement is related to force. So that is all we are doing. If it is a heat heat conduction problem, the heats are related to the temperatures, right? Temperature is the primary variable, heat is the secondary variable. Just to give a name. So this is what we are doing. So so I like you to when you see things in that way, then it opens up your mind to constitutive model development. Because I'm getting to you to think there are a lot of people continuum mechanics very very religiously devoted to it of course professor fosdick is not here so i can say it so they are so devoted to this thing that everything is latin to most people they forget ultimately they have to be computable otherwise these models mean nothing because we have to solve the problem real world problem right so when you see this my comments you say oh we should be also able to develop constitutive models that that are discrete in fact that's how we actually validate them anyway by experiments right they're not a continuum things that are coming out of your experiment you create a, a continuous curve by plotting them fitting them right so but the data that you get is discrete so and that is what we need in computers so we can create the data on the especially it is much more pertinent in geotechnical and structural problems because the data is so much that varies quite a bit depending upon uh, you know site moisture content all kinds of things right so the constitutive models as well could be very discrete because we are going to discretize the system anyway right okay so with that i think uh, my ideas of this is just to make young people in the audience to see that the world is very discrete just like we are all different people sitting around right so the distance between us even though you might say very close but depending upon the goal of your investigation we can make it a continuum or we can study as a discrete thing use uh, all kinds of molecular dynamics and other kinds of techniques now i am going to say switch it to my actual topic so in a day like this okay so i'm going to talk about two things uh, i think there is a little bit of color difference if you cannot see time to go see the ophthalmologist <laughs> okay but there is some okay what is black other is a little bit blue so the high fidelity computational models these are the two areas that i'm working cur currently so uh, one is uh, about the shell structures only to improve on it you know like i said earlier i want to improve or we are all every one of us doing something to improve in our own way so i also work with least squares based finite element models in the in solving navier stokes equations and the reason is unlike structural mechanics where the weak form finite elements is very natural because it is derived from the principle of virtual work very very connected okay it's based on a principle which is equivalent to you know the momenta principle conservation of angular and linear momenta right so but when it comes to fluid mechanics there is no such principle so what we have done is to copy the idea of taking the equation multiply with a weight function integrate by parts and it create a weak form well mathematically you are able to have a means to compute 
but there is no principle other than mathematical statement of residual being made orthogonal to the weight function. I mean, that is all you can say. There is really no principle. But whereas the least squares method is independent of any of these physical principles, only goal it has is to minimize the error you introduced into the equations through your approximation. So that is the key idea behind least squares, which is an age-old method. Okay, it have appeared in regression analysis, optimization, all over the place. If you go historically, it is the oldest of all, even older than finite difference methods. Yet, it did not come into finite elements in a majestic way, other than mathematicians played with it to talk about existence, uniqueness, all those. But they never showed that it can be very competitive method. But we have done that with respect to fluid mechanics so that it can compete with methods like finite volume. Okay? But I won't talk about that. That requires begs for a lecture on itself. So I'm not asking you to invite me again, but I'm just saying that. So the second area is this non-local. So I will talk about a little bit of that uh, in the lecture. Now in a times like this, you might say, oh, everybody doing nano and bio. Why are you doing shells? Right? I mean, you know, this. So you remember all these things that people talk about, nano and bio, is very small percentage of real world need right now. The infrastructural needs are mostly what we've been doing for the last several decades. That is not going to change. Okay? I'm not saying that you should not do that, but don't think that is the only thing to do. So, one major reason is that I really like shells. Okay, so and I want to do something that can improve on what we have. Okay, not in terms of spices or anything, but in terms of actual computation and reliability of the element. So whether you know or not, I like to mention that many of the uh, things that we do. Again, I go back to it's not a criticism because I am part of that community. We make assumptions to get answers because we are in the process of solving a problem. So in that process, we come up with some interesting fudge factors. So, but I'm going to say that these should be the desirable features of any computational scheme, whether it's finite element, finite volume, boundary elements, any of them. First, it must preserve all features of the mathematical model. So remember, mathematical model itself is incomplete, and it is goal-based. Depending upon what you want to study, you put those features into the model, okay? and never complete. In fact, there are things that happen which we don't know, aware of it, right? That's why it is incomplete. But whatever you included in mathematical model, it should be translated into computational model. Because otherwise, you're not justifying you can show that this is the equation, then you do something and you get the results not really, really related to that mathematical model. So this is a, a fair requirement, right? There is nothing unusual about it. And you might say, well, how else do you do it? Well, if you don't use right interpolation, you will lose the mathematical features. That is the point. The other thing is we always use a technique that always should have at its heart minimizing the error. And that is built into our virtual work principle, but not into others, as I already spoke about. So, but it has to have minimization should be at the heart of the minimization of the errors, should be at the heart of the comp uh, computational scheme. And third, equally important is to we must avoid using ad hoc assumptions. Okay, this is we have done, we will continue to do it when we have a lot of ignorance in understanding the phenomena. And it is happening a lot with biology because we don't have the laws of biology in place. The laws of physics are valid in biology also, but we need more, right? Suppose you take a you know, finger and try to rub. Okay, this is like a, some kind of force, right? Stimuli. And then you see color of the skin changed. Then you might even see a little bit of wetness. Okay? So then what is the relation? 
between this force and what is happening chemically? Well, we don't have a deterministic equation. We can only postulate. So, but it's okay, we are not going to stop from doing it. And in fact, engineers are the ones which are making advances in medicine. Okay, we are helping them to come up with prosthetics and you know, all kinds of devices to help relieve pain and so on. So, but in the process, we make assumptions. And this is where we introduce some approaches that are ad hoc, but some rational is behind, okay? It's okay, again, but we should try to avoid them, and that is the progress. By understanding more, we should avoid these uh, types of ad hoc approaches. So, uh, by the way, this numerical integration to reduce integration to uh, avoid locking is one of those, right? So why there is a locking? Well, locking is not coming from mathematical model. It's coming because of the way you interpolated the variables. You did not give them enough food, so they have to fight, so to speak, to have their rightful place in the equation. In the proper way to satisfy, you have to provide enough interpolation so that all variables can adjust to satisfy the equations of equilibrium. And if, when you don't do that, then they will lock the system, means over stiffen the structure. Okay? So that, and same thing happens in fluid dynamics, upwinding, artificial viscosity. All of these are kind of tricks to make the computational scheme to work in a right way. I mean, this right way is again your way of thinking about it, right? So, so we do in, invent these, but so one of the reasons I'm, why I'm doing this shell is actually there are two reasons, okay? One is to avoid all kinds of locking without intervention through these ad hoc approaches. Means I don't want to evaluate the shear stiffnesses or membrane terms using reduced integration. So this is like you want to take a medication for some disease. And, but then the medication creates side effect. And in some people, side effect could be worse, right? So that may be happening and you don't know. When you create this reduced reintegration, in some problems it may be loss of energy or it will produce negative energy in theory, right? Which is not admissible. So those things you will never know because you only checked with nice linear problems or even in simple nonlinear problems. But if they're local softening or very high velocity impact type problems, you, your element may be behaving totally uh, wrong way, not satisfying thermodynamic constraints. So that is where I like to help. And the second thing, I did say two things, right? One is to get rid of the locking. And second is equally important in large deformation problems. Just imagine that you apply a load, hypervelocity impact or whatever, what happening is it is actually deforming. Think of a shell structure with certain thickness. When it deforms, it is the area is, sorry, the total surface area is going to increase, right? Okay, you start from there and you're trying to apply the load so it is expanding. So where is the material flowing from? It has to come from the thickness. And all of the plate and shell theories that we have used, including the elements in abacus and ANSYS, are based on constant thickness. That means we don't allow the thickness to change, okay? Unless you do 3D. 3D, of course, is fully acceptable and, it, you know, but those who use plate and shell elements, they cannot do anything about it because we have this tacit assumption of transverse normals remain straight and inextensible. So those assumptions really, you know, straightness is probably not that a big a deal because we really they don't deform that much in most applications. But making the straight line to remain fixed, inextensible is a big issue. Not just in theory, in computation. See, when you say something should not change, it is artificially making transverse direction infinitely rigid. That is the issue. If you let it go, even though it's not 
expanding or stretching or compressing too much, you have not created this artificial stiffness. So that is one of the reasons. So those are the two reasons. So I'm going to just say the objective is to create a robust shell element, meaning you don't do any tricks and let it go. Okay. So, and I'll just mention, so the work started a long time ago and uh, there are few people who have worked, especially uh, uh, Eckert Rom from uh, uh, Germany, Stuttgart, and, and there are other people, but we allow most importantly this thickness stretch. So if you look at the equation, and let me use this. Okay, so this, this is a, a, does it work? Maybe battery is not there, okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So you can see this is a displacement vector which is expanded. So these are, by the way, uh, normalized three coordinates of the shell and depends upon the uh, uh, locations. And I could put time here also, but for the moment, don't worry about that. So this is the in surface, mid surface displacement vector, three unknowns, then three rotations about the three <coughs> coordinate lines, and this is the stretch. And even, this is a vector equation. So this is a vector, but it has only component in the transverse direction. Because in the other two directions, we already took care of the uh, changes in the geometry through this. So this is going to contribute to the thickness stretch of the shell. All right. Okay. So then we also go and expand. OK, let me go back a little bit. We also expand when it comes to finite elements using the spectral functions, meaning we will allow the interpolation to be as much as needed for the physics to be satisfied right. And it may not be linear. See, remember the lean, you know, people wanting to use low order elements because of whatever efficiency this and that is the cause of the uh, locking. See, you cannot use same, it's like, think about a buffet versus ordering food, right? Or if you think of buffet, if you only order food that is very little for so many people, then what happens? People have to go starving, some people at least, those who have big stomach, right? So that is exactly what happens with the variables. A variable that is low order to satisfy the differential equation will be happy. But the one that needs to satisfy higher order continuity, they will now be not doing good job, so there would be conflict. And that conflict is what we call locking. Okay? So, so we are going to use higher order interpolations. And I will say a few more words a little bit later. So that is the, by the way, this work is done with my students, so pe people like me go around present it. So the work is done by, of course, you guys, I mean, right? So, and so I'm very proud of them. So you can see this is generic uh, uh, statement. Same equation is written here in terms of now the uh, three coordinates that are shown. The thickness coordinate is denoted with xi to the three, meaning it is not a power, it is just an index superscript. So, and then we use this kind of thing to uh, create this element, which is the projection of that is shown here. So here is the, this is the mid surface of the shell element. And you note that this is a, if you look, count the number of nodes, there are five of them. So this has 25 nodes means P equal to four. Polynomial degree of any variable in the shell theory is four, okay? So these are just a C0 elements, meaning only continuity of the variables is enforced between elements. Another thing that you note, the nodes are not equidistributed. And this is what constitutes spectral interpolation. The traditional Lagrange interpolation is based on equal uh, distance between nodes. But that is going to be problematic as you go higher order in P because they become uh, dependent on each other. I'll show one picture later. So the rest of the story is very straightforward, although very, very cumbersome, especially because of 
two reasons. One, it is a shell theory. Second, it is geometrically nonlinear, full nonlinearity. So there are a lot of terms. In, in, in fact, the stiffness matrix will involve 700 some terms, I mean, very large number. And imagine doing that with your hand. So with, compared to my days of uh, going to school, now we have maple, right? So algebraic manipulators. So you can really make it do the work and even produce the statements in whatever you want, Python, C++, or Fortran, they will generate. So this is the beauty of uh, today's developments. So you can spend time doing more constructive work than just play with the algebraic manipulations and you make one mistake and then everywhere it shows up. Okay, so uh, yeah, one more thing. So we do use two things, uh, as you all know through a course on finite elements or nonlinear elasticity that we must use for large deformation analysis, green strain tensor measure. And then it is conjugate to the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. So this is the duality I mentioned earlier. So these two variables are dual to each other uh, at a continuum sense. And so then we assume, although we are now working into uh, inelasticity, but right now we assume a linear relationship between the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor and green strain tensor, meaning it's a materially linear elasticity. But you all know second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor, it's a mouthful, is a mathematical entity. It's not physical. It's the only stress measure that is physical is the Cauchy stress. That is the change, sorry, the force per deformed area and measured in the deformed configuration. Okay, that is the second Piola Kirchhoff uh, uh, Cauchy stress tensor. Cauchy stress tensor is measured per deformed unit area, but and also measured in the deformed coordinate system, right? And that's physical. But what we have done, because we don't know the deformed configuration to compute in a finite element context, we refer everything to the configuration that we know, right? And in that process, we created this mathematical entity known as second Piola Kirchhoff stress sensor. So, by the end of the day, if you are trying to check the uh, some failure criteria or something. You have to come back to Cauchy stress through transformation. So what I'm tr why I'm saying all this is this relationship between the second Piola Kirchhoff stress and green strain tensor may be linear, but when you write in terms of the Cauchy stress, it becomes nonlinear automatically. Okay, all right. So with that, let me show some uh, results because I don't want to talk about all the inner details, but uh, this is the really second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor definition in terms of the Cauchy stress tensor. <coughs> that means once I compute this, I can always compute this by inverting this equation. And this is the linear relation I spoke of where C is the elasticity tensor. So we have done with this two things. One, of course, we created a layered medium of shell, means a laminar composite shell. So we, can, we have the facility to create any geometry we want by defining the tangent and normal. So it doesn't have to be developable shell. It could be quite arbitrary shell, okay? And second, we also made it uh, functionally graded. Means you can have a continuous variation through the thickness as you desire. Of course, that comes from, again, optimization. So, what are the main features? The, it is a seven parameter formulation. I will also speak of 12, but I won't go into the detail. But 12 is just to check, is there any more improvement? And we found improvement is not that much. So, the thickness stretch is included. And then, the important thing is, because this is included, then you have the E33, green strain tensor component in the transfer direction is no longer zero. So that means we have all strain components non-zero. So you have to use 3D constitutive equations. And remember, this is a, a mathematical thing. Physically, material is material, it's all 3D. But when we develop plate and shell theories, because of the assumptions we made, 
we were using plain stress reduced constitutive equations. But now we do not need to. All right? Then we use a consistent displacement uh, uh, interpolation. We do not use linear for everything because we know the rotation like variables have to be inconsistent with the displacement like variable. So, that means displacements have to be higher order than the rotation variables and that was the problem of locking. And so, then computationally we use this spectral HP finite elements to have this consistent interpolation. Then we also, I will show you that static condensation of the degrees of freedom because as you go high in P, the element has a lot of internal nodes which are not talking to each other, right? They do not participate in the interconnectivity, so you can statically condense them to make it more efficient. And then of course, it is applicable to all kinds of problems that uh, the element is capable of. So, this is just want to show you, if you think of a plate with a hole and you create a mesh and this is one element by the way and again this element is p equal to 4 means in the, uh, the it has 25 nodes and out of 25, 9 of them inside, only 16 are on the boundary. Okay? So, those nine do not talk to each other because I mean uh, they talk to each other, but not outside that element. So, if you condense them, the mesh looks like this. I mean it did not lose anything by the way, it is only static condensation, it is not like throwing them out, right. We statically condense, meaning the effect of them is written in terms of the those on the boundary of the element. So, the as a result, if it is p equal to 7, the saving is tremendous, 72 percent reduction in the computational power. So, as a result, the higher order elements that are I am proposing here, they have the same requirement as lower order elements like 4 degree, sorry, 4 noded or 8 noded elements. Okay? So, the both in terms of memory as well as the computational power. So, now I want to show you few examples and these are mostly so called benchmark type problems and th those are well respected in the community as. So, this is a problem of a taking a strip applying a pure moment. Okay? So, it is rolling as you can see and it keep rolling. Of course, we have to use a Rix type algorithms to capture the uh, large rotations as well as the uh, for each load you have multiple solutions because it is going through. right? It's, so, you will see uh, and there are many problems that we have done. These are just showing and I will show you one more. Uh, there are several more, but in the interest of time I will not show all of them. So, this is another one where a, a circular plate strip fixed here then subjected to a line load at the end of the strip. So, as you can see the structure as it is lifted and most of you as engineers can figure out what it is going to do, but you may not be able to determine the actual and uh, quantitatively. You know, knowing qualitatively is the easy thing because you are used to it, seeing those things. Your mind works right away, oh this is what is going to happen. Obviously, it is not only just lifting, in the process of lifting the inside is going to be less, it is going to the outside is more flexible than inside of the, right? This inside would be a little more stiffer than the outside. So, and it will create the, uh, what you call lot of shearing goes on here. Okay? So, you can determine the shear stresses as needed and especially if it is a laminated composite structure, the interlaminar stresses cause delamination. So, it is important to have very accurate prediction of that. And there are other kinds of shell problems. So, like this one you already saw. So, this is a dome, uh, hemispherical dome with the cutout at the top. So, all that, by the way, these are all elements, the actual elements, but before we statically condense them out. Okay? So, you know, we use P as much as 6 to 8. And some problems like this one, if you use abacus, suppose you apply a blast load or something. Okay? This is a static problem. So, I am going to say this, you know, apply the a load, point load and you will 
get solution in abacus, but after a few load steps, it won't converge anymore. Because you don't have the ability more than quadratic in the commercial codes. Okay, well, there are new codes coming on the block, but at least the most commonly used ANSYS and abacus are limited to linear and quadratic elements. So, and so you can see a typical element is right here. So if you count them, this is p equal to 8. And so I'll just uh, show you. So I'm just showing the capability of the element. So we are applying point load. So the, this kind of kinematics of deformation, too severe. Right? There is no way Abacus-like program can predict it. OK? All right. So of course, there is a very important thing. I don't want you to go away thinking, that, oh, you can do everything in the world. So this is under the assumption of still the body, the elasticity is still there. That means when you release it, it comes back like cell. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the next step, OK? You remember, like Newton said, we do whatever we do, stand on the shoulders of joints, right? I'm not saying I'm a joint, but I'm saying next thing you have to do, OK, is to add the inelasticity. By the way, this can happen in thin elastic structures that are even they have large strains, but don't really become plastic. Okay? So by the way, shell doesn't mean always civil engineering structure. Right? There are so many kinds of shells in nature. Carbon nanotube is a shell. Right? Your eardrum is a shell. Your skull is a shell. Right? So they come in all kinds of forms and thicknesses. So I will stop this part and uh, Okay, there is one more example, but uh, so this is a again so a shell uh, which is pu pulled two opposite directions. So what happens is perpendicular direction they are going to go, and when the moment it touches, this touches to the other side, we stop the computation because we don't have contact mechanics in there, right? It cannot interpenetrate. So, but you can see, since you do not constrain how much deformation going on and stress computation, if you arrest it, fixed at the top and bottom, that much of deformation is stopped means a lot of stresses will be created. And the last example of this is the well cerebrated uh, problem in one of the benchmark problem, where I want to show you the, uh, the effect of this thickness stretch. It's not just imagined thing, OK? Well, it is imagined in the sense that in case if the body is going to have large deformation, what happens to the thickness? If it doesn't, it's not a large deformation, thickness stretch is negligible. From engineering point of view, we should not waste our time, OK? So my message is not to dump everything. Only when you need large deformation, there is a change in thickness. So here is a shell. I fix the ends and the internally pressurize. So then what happens to it, as you can imagine, so it's going to undergo it stretches in the center, but the ends are the same, right? So now I'm going to plot the thickness change. So if you see the thickness change, it is right here. So it is kind of normalized with the original thickness. So the, at the ends, it is basically not much, OK? So then you can see in the center of the shell, there is a large change. It's at least 10%, right? So you can see, and of course, we also did 12 parameter means ex, you know, expanded more, more unknowns, but more mathematical. So it really didn't change that much. Uh, Amabili, you know, I work with him. He created a, some kind of analytical solution, but his analytical solution, because of the assumptions he made, it kind of oscillates, OK? So this, these are just to check your sanity, so to speak. It doesn't mean his solution is the reference solution. It's not, because he made more assumptions than we made in us, uh, FEM. So that, and then one more important thing, OK? You might say, why don't we just 3D shell element, uh, 3D finite element? Then I don't have to worry about thickness stretch because it's going to deform the way it is, right? So then comes this uh, practicality. So I'm showing you here, a lot of things here, but this is a stress, okay? 
So, displacement is every code will represent almost same number. Very, very good. But when it comes to stresses, I don't know how many of you experienced. If you use abacus and ANSYS, compare them for large deformation, you don't get the same numbers. Most of the time, people don't realize because they are only using one code. But if you do compare, so here is a, first I'm showing you this open circle and open square. These are the shell elements. By the way, when you use the word shell element is not same in both codes. They are different. Okay? So the results produced by them is agreeable. All right? Then you use ANSYS 3D and Abacus 3D. The way they implement, again, they are not same. So look at that. They do all the way up to here, same. But then you can see Abacus 3D is going this way, and ANSYS 3D is going this way for certain load. Up to certain load, they are very good. And whereas the seven parameter, 12 parameter, see they are very close to this 3D. More importantly, this is 3D compared to shell. OK? So that means shell elements are not capable of producing. These are the standard shell element without thickness stretch. So whereas I have the shell element with thickness stretch comes very close to 3D. When you see that, it's very comforting because the number of degrees of freedom for shell element vastly less. Okay? So look at this table. So the seven parameter, you don't worry about the 12 parameter here. So it only takes 2,000 degrees of freedom as opposed to 50,000 by ANSYS 3D solid or Abacus 50,000. Of course, the, the way they implement Abacus takes less amount of time than ANSYS. So this is our computation because we use those codes to validate or compare our results. We only take 66 seconds. So this is the key. What is the contribution? That by having this thickness stretch, you are able to capture the three D effects. Second, it's computationally much more efficient. So my lecture is kind of done because I'm going to give only one, if you allow me, okay? Uh, because I remember the original title was only shell, but I added this non-local, and I want to you to know a little bit about this non-locality, especially when it comes to the non-locality comes in two ways. One is in local information prediction. Second, a global information prediction. And I want to explain what that means in a moment. So locally, if you think of a fracture, so we idealize always fracture as just a crack, right? Some line. But when you look at under microscope, crack is always, it's not like that. It's more like this, OK? That means it doesn't have this blunt edge. It has really a, a certain amount of curvature there. So, but the way it, this will propagate under the load, it depends upon what is happening in the neighborhood, not at one point. See, people think that one point is getting weaker, it will do. Well, there are soldiers around that weak soldier who are protecting it. So what happens is even the soldiers here are getting weaker. Only then crack propagates. Until that, it doesn't. Okay? So we have made the Griffith criteria is more of a, I mean, when we didn't have any, anything better, we used it. But now it is time, you know, this uh, integral approach, uh, you know, rice, the J integral, all those are helpful, but they are more of a integral effect. It's not a point effect. So to bring the point effect, you have to do non-local you know, studies. So that, I just gave a little bit of that. Now let's think of this is a work done by McFarland and Colton, you know, not way back, but in 2005, about 13 years, 14 years ago. It's a micro-mechanical system. So you think of a, this, whatever the device is, it has a cantilever beam for sensing and actuation. When you apply the load, of course, load would be in pico newtons, not very large load. But according to our strength of materials understanding, the deflection under that point load at that location is equal to what? It's a test now. What is the value of the deflection under the point load of a cantilever beam? 
P L cube over 3 E i, right? Okay. So now you remember that 3 E i is in the denominator. That means if I have E small or i small, the deflection goes up, right? So if you reduce the thickness of this cantilever beam, which is shown now 10 microns, okay, the, this height is called W, but it doesn't matter, but it's a height. Suppose you reduce the height, what happens? Where is the height going to go into the formula? Into the I, right? And I has BH cube over 12. And that H is the W here. When you make the W small, I is getting small at a rate of 3 even, right? So then that means it will have large deflection. But these people found it was getting actually stiffer. See, now you are in dilemma. What is, what is wrong? You go check your math again 10 times. So, it does, so then you say, oh, there is something wrong with the formula. Then you say, well, we cannot blame Timoshenko, right? Then you say, oh, our continuum mechanics needs some modification. And that is how the, so this, see, when we cannot explain physical phenomena, we have to think all the way to the square one. So it's not in between, okay? Because these formulas have been used and they are really respected. Lot of structures are made, they are standing, right? So you cannot question that as a bad formula. But there is something else happening when the device becomes miniature type. When the volume of the body is smaller than the surface area, something else coming into picture. And we have not accounted for it. So this is non-locality. So I'm not going to show my research or anything here, but to give some indication of what this non-locality is. So another one is Rod Lakes from Wisconsin, your neighbor. So he has been working in biomechanics for a long time. So he, he tested the bones by doing this twisting. Again, it's exactly the same kind of formula. You remember the, in this case, instead of the I, there is a J, polar moment of inertia. So when you reduce the diameter, it should have more rotation, right? More flexible. And, but he found it is more stiffer. Okay? So, well, in the case of bones, it is it's not so much of the smallness, but it is it has something else going on in the structure. Okay, these so-called osteons. They are in the form of you know millimeter micrometer, sorry. That by the way, that should have been M uh, mu. So very, very small, but they do something when you twist, okay? So as a result, so what could be happening, just like a soft tissue measurement, if you train that tissue for a while, then it is going to be a little bit more like a solid. Before that, it has a fluid in there, right? So it, has a, so it tends to be stiffer. So that's probably what is happening. So you create a, a theory, constitutive model, that will have a fudge factor, which let's call it as length scale. And you play with this length scale until it matches the experiments. And that's what he did. And he said, oh, okay, my length scale is this. So then it is our job to find out, figure out, how does this length scale come in, in terms of physics that composes the structure, right? So that is a challenge. So there are a lot of interesting, outstanding problems. So so there are people have done a lot of different ways. So people created Coserat or micropolar continuum theories, then straight gradient, gradient theories, modified coupled stress theories, and Erringen's integral and differential models. All of these are different kinds of constitutive models, but they bring length scales in a uh, generic way. They don't explain physical way. So we have work to do, especially experimental especially at a low scales and because without that we cannot make a advance so i'm going to stop here and i'll skip some of the slides but uh, because i have other things to talk but uh, in the interest of time uh, because this was a topic that i did not plan but when i was on the flight i had time a little bit i said well let me also introduce to young folks in the audience something that you might be interested in as a additional. Okay, so I'll start, uh, just close by giving, hey? Okay. 
Okay, so these are closing remarks. So, so you saw the experimental evidence that there is non-locality in structures. Why is that? It will come. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there is experimental evidence, and of course, modeling is also showed that. Uh, this word modeling here is suppose you take a big ship structure just for example so ship structure can have 12 stories by the way if it is a one of those cruise ships right all kinds of things like even deck is made of a lot of corrugation all that right so if you want to do finite element analysis what do you do i mean suppose you go work for one of these uh, swedish or uh, uh, what is that other kind uh, Finland, right? Norway. Uh, Norway. Norway is the probably the one of the best. They have a lot of those crew. So if they want you to model it, what do you do? Break it into smaller pieces and model the pieces. Right. So you when you take this deck, you just say, okay, I'm, I have beams, right? So you will create all that I, E, everything you create, right? But the all the corrugations, the specific architecture of everything, if you have to include, it will be trillions of not even millions, okay, billion. So it is impossible. So then this is where again you bring the fudge factor. That means this time the fudge factor is physical. That means you can calculate all those details into form of a factor. That means the architectural details. We have done it, okay. So and you need only thousands of elements, not trillions. So this non-locality in this case is the information you omitted in your other model. So you can bring it. So there are both extremes require this non-local modeling. Okay? So that is what I mean by modeling evidence. So anyway, so non-classical continuum mechanics brings additional means to address missing things. Okay? And of course, these are the uh, theories that are shown to work and they are related. In fact, we have shown that and they actually bring stiffening effect. That means structures are more stiffer at those scales than you think, or classical mechanics predicts. All right, so the, I, I want to just uh, say that a generalized or non-classical continuum theories, such as Cosserat elasticity, they are required to model material behavior more accurately. So this is a very, very important Thing that means you don't only think of structures, but you also have to think of constitutive models. Okay. All right. So I want to thank you for uh, your patience, and I want to thank uh, every one of you here on a Friday, and especially beautiful day by looking at the sunshine, <laughs> even though it is cold. Uh, I should not say that word because. My colleague here told me this is a, a typical February day in Minnesota. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh, and I think we are not chased out of this room today, so we have time for uh, numbers. Yeah, yeah, questions. please. Uh, I, I'm not promising that I would answer every question, but I can always kind of remark, make a remark, comment. So, but this is for young people, not to show all the books that you, Henrik was talking about, 21 of them. But every time I wrote a book, not for to compete with Ted Belichko or Tom Hughes or J.T. Oden, but it is you. I always have people who might be using my book in mind. How well, how clearly I can explain, which requires me to understand very well. Otherwise, I cannot explain, right? So my books are really for people who are using. So that is how, and I didn't know that I had the talent until things changed and people started telling me. So there is really a lot to be done. Okay, I'm, I'm again saying young people, our life on the, in the time scale is a point. Mm -hmm. And even that point probably you have to use microscope to see. So, but we can enjoy that small amount of time in our lifetime by doing what we are passionate about. So most important that is two things, effort and the patience with it. If you give up too soon before results come, then you lost all the effort, right? 
So you have to focus and uh, driven to do something. And again, take pride in whatever little you do. Thank you. So a uh, question, so inspired by one of your last uh, slides. Uh, uh, when I think about non-locality, I think about uh, the existence of some land scale in the physical problems and perhaps a place in the model where that land scale shows up. So what exactly does it show up in your model? I think it has to do with that thickness that you manage. And so where do we see the evidence of these non-local attributes in some of the simulations you showed? Right. Okay, so the non-local parameter comes in some cases only purely material length scale. Okay, so that is the case actually in the micro type things that we showed. But whereas in other cases like the ship structure example I mentioned, it is a combination of, because it's stiffness that is what you are missing. The stiffnesses of the little things that you kind of homogenized. Okay. Or you have to count, if you want to do exact analysis, you have to count every one of them. So by bringing this length scale into structural theories, and the length scale is now combination of the material properties and the architecture of the actual geometry of the web core uh, geometries. So it will have both, because you are creating the shear stiffness uh, uh, and also the extensional stiffness and also the coupling stiffnesses, all of these are length scales in the global equations that are still based on standard plate and shell theories, except you added these extra terms. Okay? So, so, and, but the first one is the most harder one because there we don't have a handle on exactly what is contributing to that material length scale. So people have created these fudge factors like, you know, they played with by adding, I didn't show one equation. Think about the constitutive equation for an isotropic solid. Sigma ij is equal to 2 mu epsilon ij plus lambda epsilon kk delta ij, right? So what they did is add one more term to it. And that term has to do with micro rotation, okay? Micro rotation. And you, you, you stick a constant with it. And then you have to find a way to determine that parameter by doing micro rotation. I mean, that experiment is not easy. A physicist may be able to dream about doing something like that. So that is the parameter he plotted, that L I showed 0.09. So he played with it until it matched. But now you have to go back and say, what is this L really, right? So, so there are still a lot of outstanding issues with the non-local mechanics. So there are a lot of papers. In last one decade, I don't know how many, but thousands of papers came. But all of them are just playing with the, using a fudge factor to show the results. So the fudge factor doing stiffening or not, what is the parametric effect? But you don't see too much of work in terms of experimental evidence to characterize these length scales. So there is a lot to be done. Any other questions? I want to go back to being an engineer again. Um, you made a compelling argument that changes in thicknesses end up being important when you look at large deformation. You preface that with the statement that, of course, for small deformations, uh, it's an unnecessary complication. Right. Do you have a rule of thumb? a magnitude of deformations, a, a, a metric of some sort, so I can know when I have to do one versus the other. Right, excellent question. In fact, people ask this question in the nonlinear finite element class. When do you know nonlinearity kicks in, right? So rule of thumb in those cases, when the deflect, transverse deflection exceeds the thickness, of, right? So then you know. See, a lot of times we don't realize. We are, as a bookish people, just think of things. But really, structures don't deform too much. I mean, if they deform, this would be already doing like that, right? So you cannot see with the naked eye. That is the nature of the real world designs. Otherwise, it's a bad design, right? Mm -hmm. So, but in structures where they are subjected to loads, I mean, not the building structures, explosion or something or uh, terrorist attack on something, right? So then they do go through large deformation. And then the strains have to be of order of 10%. 
okay, to be able to see the thickness change. If it is 5 percent large deformation, but not large enough to make a difference in the thickness change. So, there is again these rule of thumbs come by doing the analysis. Okay? There is no formula that comes in, but you after you know experience leads into these statements. Uh, so, maybe we can stop at that point. And so, take one more time, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.